it's a very great pleasure to be invited down here. Um, I have to tell you the temperature in Chicago is about 45, and so uh, it's an interesting experience both to come and to see the sun. We haven't seen it up there, I think, for six weeks. Um, I, I thought I'd like to talk to you today about some of the interesting aspects of both the diagnosis and the treatment of uh, violent adolescents, because violent adolescents are the youngsters who causes, obviously, the most anxiety, although they are often not the youngsters who are in the greatest trouble. Now, it's trite to say that the etiology of disturbance is biopsychosocial, but in adolescent psychiatry, that is not a trite phrase, it's a, actually a phrase which has enormous meaning, because adolescence is a biological event. Uh, without puberty, there is no adolescence. Uh, adolescence is, of course, a psychological event um, because um, there are all sorts of psychological changes go on in terms of the development of autonomy. And, of course, there wouldn't be an adolescence at all unless our society wanted one. And I'd remind you that just as we invented childhood in the 18th century, we probably invented adolescence in the 19th century. And so adolescence, in fact, is a biopsychosocial situation. What's also terribly interesting about it is that the, there are really very clearly, um, as it were, psychological responses to, the, to puberty which are culture-free. That is, it's very interesting because here are physiological changes taking place in the human body and there are psychological responses to it which are not related to the culture you're in. That is, even in societies that don't have an adolescence, uh, you get psychological reactions to puberty. And they are extraordinarily interesting reactions, and I would mention them only so that perhaps one can understand the etiology, or part of the etiology of violent behavior. When we become pubertal, we have this very interesting experience psychically that having learned to control our bodies, and we do learn to control our bodies prior to puberty, and have a rather grandiose feeling that we know all about ourselves, we suddenly find ourselves with our bodies behaving in ways that are quite out of control and all cultures are extremely interested in human beings learning control mechanisms. Now when our bodies get out of control this has as it were the two side effects of this. Uh, on the one hand when you're pubertal it's gratifying it's really rather nice when your genitalia grow and your breasts grow and you grow taller and so on. Unfortunately um, you can't stop all this process. You, you get a period whether you like it or not. Uh, you get multiple erections whether you like it or not. And as a side effect of this happening, human beings, all human beings, experience a certain degree of psychic helplessness. And I put it to you as a hypothesis that the one thing that human beings cannot tolerate of all their psychic experiences is to be helpless. It's probably the most painful. Now, we then, of course, take enormous steps to deal with helplessness, and we try to get a environmental mastery, which is a way of getting mastery over ourselves. And if you think about it, that clearly must be involved in the process of the development of autonomy. <coughs> but there's a very interesting side effect of helplessness, which is this, that when we are helpless, we very easily feel tormented. And as a matter of fact, if I was a terribly boring lecturer, which I like to think I'm not, but if I was, and you were kept sitting here for long periods of time, you know, the seats would get harder and harder and harder, and the whole experience would become more and more persecutory. And there's no question about it that if we are helpless as people, we feel tormented. Those of you who've been in a general hospital, for example, know that when you're lying in bed helplessly, and you know, and the attending staff man comes around with his covey of medical students and so on and so forth and looks at you and then goes outside in the corridor and begins to talk about you, you get utterly convinced that he is saying things about you that nothing would, under no circumstances, be said to your face and heaven knows what they are. Of course, he's actually probably talking about the football game, but that's not what you experience. You experience a sense of torment. Now, adolescent or pubertal youngsters dealing with helplessness, easily tormented, then, in fact, relate to their parents in a way that makes previous parental actions tormenting now. And what happens is, 
that the actions and words of parents which prior to puberty were felt as acceptable are no longer felt as acceptable. And the change is not initially in the response of the parent. The change initially is in the response of the child because they now feel helpless, they thus feel tormented. And so when mother says, I don't really like that sweater you've got on, dear, would you go and change it? This becomes the most horrendously tormenting comment that can be made and no child ever experienced a mother like this before. And so what the children then do is they in fact make their parents feel helpless, they project it. Now, a side effect of feeling helpless is that you start to feel you have to torment people, you do it back. And so you have this experience as a pubertal adolescent that you feel tormented by your parents, you respond negatively to what they do, you make them feel failures, and they then start to coerce and torment you. And thus you get a validity to your experience. That is to say, you feel tormented, you sort of know you're not, and yet you make your parents tormenting, and thus, interestingly, you can begin the process of adolescence. Because you cannot leave people unless they are bad. That is, if in fact we perceived our parents as only loving, then what would happen would be we'd never grow up. Why should we? And so that what in fact happens is that we begin, as it were, to use a biological event, and this has psychological responses, and then this begins to be of value socially, and as it were, in this rather deterministic way, you can say that we can allow ourselves to leave childhood behind. Now, leaving childhood behind is a painful experience, actually, particularly if you have a good childhood. And as a matter of fact, one of the very interesting responses of early adolescence, as distinct from puberty, is that early adolescents experience a lot of sadness. And one of the diagnostic issues that's extraordinarily important for all of us is to differentiate between the sadness of normative early adolescence, which is to do with the loss of childhood, as against the feelings of being depressed and mood disordered. Now, if in fact we respond to the environment in the way I have described, if we then suffer from mood shifts which we cannot control, we are, as, were, as human beings, being hit, if I may put it this way, with a sort of double whammy. Because on the one hand, I have to deal with the psychological changes that occur because of normative physical change. But if, in addition, my moods are shifting in ways that are incomprehensible, the whole process of being helpless gets worse. And so, in a, and if you start to think about this, by the way, you can begin to understand why learning disabled children, for example, begin to act up dramatically at puberty. Because until puberty, they're, not de they're dealing with the helplessness of being learning disabled, by which they may, from which they may be protected by their parents. But once they become pubertal, they can no longer be protected by their parents because they need to, as it were, leave parenting behind to some extent. And in addition, an, along with the helplessness of being learning disabled, you then furthermore get the helplessness of uh, growth. And this, I think, begins to explain why trouble starts to start at puberty. And one should understand this. Now, if we are to gain environmental mastery, which we, I believe, need to in order to be, um, have any sense of wholeness, what we clearly do is find out what our environment will tolerate. And I would offer you as a hypothesis that whatever the conflicts you may have psychologically, whatever conflicts or whatever troubles you may have biologically, what you do with them in order to deal with the sense of helplessness, loss, and so on, is you find out ways of behaving which the social system will allow. For example, in terms of the use of purgatives by early and middle adolescent girls, it's almost certain, nobody can be quite sure, that girls did not use the technique of self-purgation 
until an article appeared in Seventeen magazine which said, whatever you do, you shouldn't take purgatives. And as soon as that was said, lo and behold, in mid it, it, it certainly fitted chronologically, in middle and early adolescence, the use of purgation became extraordinarily fashionable. Uh, this would also explain why certain types of disorder become extremely acceptable in different types of community. Uh, for example, in um, lower socioeconomic class groups, uh, one way of trying to resolve your problems if you're a, a girl in trouble uh, is to become pregnant. In middle class groups, this is less acceptable, although becoming more so. In other words, social systems will tell us what we can do. Now this means that in terms of behavior, which is a way of helping us diagnose emotional difficulties, you're likely to get two types of behavior. You're going to get behavior which is very much related to what the culture allows and the social system allows, and you're going to get behavior which is culture-free. Now, one of the significant etiologies of violent behavior, and there is a type of violent behavior, which I choose to call affective violence, that is rageful violence, which is clearly physiologically based. People who become enraged have a whole string of brain biological responses, a whole string of neuroendocrine responses and endocrine responses, which are specific to the rage. And clearly, that intensity of rage has to be based on brain biology. You cannot explain the thought of human being who becomes so enraged that they kick and scream and bite. You cannot explain that in terms of culture or in terms of psychology. It's only explicable, by the way, in terms, I think, in terms of what's happening to brain biology. Interestingly, this sort of rage occurs in the animal kingdom. And in the animal kingdom, it's called affective aggression. But I don't think you should use the word aggression for human beings in terms of violence, because they're not synonyms. And aggression in human beings is usually thought of as rather more constructive than, than, than violent behavior. Now, those human beings who suffer from that sort of violent behavior, in which they get absolutely overwhelmed, mostly in that violence, the, what they do is not going to be culturally determined. Mostly, not completely. On the other hand, whether or not you, how you react to the violence will certainly be culturally determined. Because there's another type of violence, which is predatory violence. Now, predatory violence is planned behavior. It's hunting, and man has taught its children to hunt from time immemorial, and in big cities such as Chicago, for example, the gangs teach their initiates how to hunt, but they're teaching them how to hunt other people. They're, they're not teaching them how to hunt animals. And there are very many interesting processes go on in connection with this hunting type of behavior, which is planned violence. So what happens in human beings is this, that if you have an on the whole culture free response to affective disturbance, I say on the whole because I'll give you the, the exception in a minute, which is violent behavior, one way that the human being deals with this is to say, rather than be violent in a way that I cannot understand and explain, I would rather plan to be violent. So human beings plan violent behavior as a way of trying to control their own impulsive violence. So one of the problems in terms of understanding violence, and by the way, this is a problem of the literature, that people will talk about items of violence, and they will talk about the use of medication to solve violent behavior, and they will count the number of items of violence. But they do, they do not differentiate violent behavior which is driven by brain biology from b violent behavior which is driven by psychosocial systems. And so, in fact, if you treat somebody who suffers from affective rage, you do not necessarily stop 
their rage responses because predatory rage is learned that is you learn to be violent if I may put it this way so as not to be violent that is it is better to be violent because I plan it than to be violent when it hits me makes me helpless overwhelms me and so on so one of the problems of research, by the way, in terms of behavior, is exactly what sort of behavior is it. And merely saying, I hit you on the head, and this is an item of violence, does not mean that that's the same violence as if I hit you on the head because I'm enraged. You being hit will feel the same way. I, the hitter, if I may put it this way, may be doing it for quite different reasons. And so clearly, if you're looking for the control of violent behavior and looking for what intervention will stop it, merely saying the item is being hit on the head, if I may make, use that example, does not mean that anything you do is necessarily of significance, which is, by the way, one of the interesting aspects, I think, of dealing with behavior in relationship to its etiology and what you do about it. Now, when I said that affective rage is on the whole culture-free, the feeling of rage is culture-free. What you do is not necessarily culture-free. Interestingly, if you are brought up in a family group that never hits, when you get an affective rage response, you do not hit people. You may beat your fist in the wall, you may throw something, but you don't hit others because you've never internalized at all the concept that hitting others is acceptable. So in fact, far from being spare the rod and spoil the child, generally it's use the rod and spoil the child. And there's no question about it that, for example, in the black community in Chicago in which family violence is regrettably more acceptable than in other communities, violent behavior in the children is also more likely. And so a black youngster who suffers from affective rage in Chicago is far more likely to attack other people than the youngster who's, if you like, a middle-class white who, who doesn't use violence, who will respond to their rage quite differently. So even in terms of the internal experience, you may get different types of behavior. Now, in mood disorder, however, interestingly, there are some fascinating culture-free symptoms. And these seem to appear in all social class groups and in all ethnic groups. And if you're interested, in the etiology of violence, or in the etiology of almost any behavioral disturbance of youngsters, you have to ask whether these symptoms are present. Because the children never volunteer them in our experience. Children, if you ask a youngster how he or she sleeps, they will tell you that they sleep badly, perhaps. But they will not tell you what their sleep pattern is. And as a matter of fact, you then very specifically have to ask, do you find difficulty in falling asleep or do you wake up? And if the children will talk about waking up rather than falling asleep as a difficulty, you've got one culture-free symptom. That is, intermittent wakefulness is a symptom of an affective disorder which may occur in all social class and ethnic groups and is unrelated to culture. The next thing you have to ask, though, which is a very typical culture-free symptom, is about eating. Because in children and adolescents, as in adults, if you suffer from a biologically-based mood disorder, this may interfere with your eating patterns. However, this is where culture rears its ugly head. You cannot ask adolescents if they eat breakfast anymore. At one time, you could say, do you eat breakfast? And if the child didn't eat breakfast, well, my goodness, that was pathological. Nowadays in Chicago, if you do eat breakfast, it's probably pathological. That, that, that in fact, people just don't eat breakfast. The, the most you ever do is throw some cornflakes in a bowl, slurp them down, and rush out. So you can no longer say to people, do you eat breakfast? Because that doesn't prove anything. However, if you say to human beings, when do you get hungry?
you get some absolutely fascinating responses, which, by the way, in youngsters have all sorts of very interesting implications. The child who doesn't eat breakfast gets hungry at about 9.30 to 10. The mood disorder child who doesn't eat breakfast gets hungry at noon or later. So if you ask when you get hungry, you're learning something about the effects of a mood disturbance. If you ask, did you eat breakfast, you're not. I might say in passing that this has very interesting implications for the educational system. Because if your blood sugar is low, you do not concentrate as well. We also think, by the way, for, for children who are learning to, be, to formally think, that when their blood sugar goes down, they cannot formally think as well. Now, if you think of the average junior high school, where the children have not eaten breakfast, and certainly in Chicago, nobody is giving them a snack at 9.30. And in fact, if they eat a chocolate bar, there's a hell of a row, because why are you eating in class? You know, this sort of circle going on. In fact, in a very interesting way, by ignoring human physiology, we are probably making human learning more difficult, which is fairly standard, I think, at any rate, in our part of the world. So you ask about... Um, appetite, you ask about sleep, you ask about irritability. Now irritability again is very interesting because adolescents get irritable when they're tired. So you see with children where you can ask about irritability and if they have put to bed reasonably and they get irritable in the morning that is significant. With adolescents uh, some of them will say they're irritable at night because they're sleepy which contaminates it. So irritability is not as helpful as a culture free symptom as the other two. However, there's a very interesting one, which drives adolescents berserk. It's the rapid mood fluctuation, which is inexplicable. And one of the very interesting aspects of culture-free symptoms is many, many children will suffer from very rapid mood shifts, which they cannot explain on the basis of reality. And that is terribly disconcerting and makes youngsters feel extraordinarily helpless. It, you know, it's interesting if you ask them about it, to sort of sit in a class, and if you can say, I'm bored because the teacher's giving a lousy lecture, or a lousy talk, that's fair enough. But if you're fluctuating between being elated and being empty, and being elated and being emptied, empty, and this is a very rapid mood fluctuation, children find this incredibly disturbing. As a matter of fact, we think that's very significant in, in the etiology of marijuana abuse. We found a significant number of adolescents who abuse pot not because they want the high, they abuse pot because they want the low. Because they can explain feeling, uh, because everybody knows that you veg out with pot. And therefore they find a reality explanation for an emotional mood shift. And so one of the things they will do is use what's available in the society, and in our society certainly marijuana is available, and they will use this to begin to deal with the inner experience that goes with a mood disorder. Now, if in fact a youngster suffers from these mood disorders, one of the great unknowns at the moment, and it is a great unknown, particularly if you're looking at the biological basis of, say, violence, is what type of, as it were, biological intervention should you use? Um, are we in fact dealing with the equivalent of an adult manic illness, in which case almost certainly you'd intervene with lithium, or are we dealing with the equivalent of an adult depressive illness, in which you'd almost certainly intervene, to begin with anyway, with a tricyclic antidepressant? And here you have this sort of mishmash of symptoms that occur, can occur in children. You can get, for example, we've got one like this. We have a 15-year-old boy who has a lifetime history of learning disability, who has a lifetime history of attention deficit disorder. He's a middle-class youngster. He's been pushed from place to place to place. Eventually, he was placed by the school system in a behavior modification system, uh, which made him incredibly depressed. Um, he also intermittently had episodes of violence in which he lost control. Um, and he presents himself to us with this positive museum of sort of psychopathology and organic pathology. And um, as it were, when you, when you look as to where you should intervene,
certainly biologically, it's the most incredibly complicated. Now, there are a number of sort of biological tests you can use, which, of course, regrettably in adolescence are not nearly as uh, effective, probably, as they are in uh, adults. You can use um, the dexamethasone suppression test, which, as you know, is related to whether or not you suppress cortisol excretion with dexamethasone. And in about 30 to 40 percent of adolescents, we think, that when that test is positive, it means that they have a type of mood disorder which will respond to a tricyclic antidepressant. However, if it's negative, it does not mean that they will not respond to a tricyclic antidepressant. They well might. You can do um, a urinary MHPG, which if it's high, indicates that the type of illness is in some way related to an adult manic illness. Unfortunately, you can get the position, and we get it often, in which the symptoms, I'm still talking about culture-free symptoms, that a child presents looks very much like a manic type of illness. Uh, the urinary MHPG is uh, normal, uh, the dexamethasone suppression test is positive, and so in effect, what have you got? And the symptoms of manic type illness in children and adolescents are absolutely fascinating. If you happen to have an infant who decides regularly and consistently to play at three in the morning, and this does not change, that is, if the infant's circadian rhythms don't, suffer, don't as it were, meet the circadian rhythms of the family, you can begin to suspect that you might have a manic infant. And as a matter of fact, one of the problems of these infants is that they start off with a biological difficulty, but imagine yourself as the hard-working parents of a child who insists on getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning every morning, insists on playing thereafter, and will not go to sleep. Uh, I suggest you, you will cease to become loving parents fairly speedily. And so the child, as it were, will then begin to be reared in an environment which is psychonoxious developmentally. That is, if you have one of these mood disorders as an infant, this is almost certainly going to interfere with the sort of nurturing that, that you receive. And the nurturing you receive will be less adequate. We will take this infant, this dysphoric child, as they're called, who at the age of three, from the age of three on, is unbelievably grandiose. Uh, I mean, grandiosity in infants is, in fact, a symptom which drives people wild because the children won't listen to reason, and this is how it appears. It appears as grandiosity in terms of there's no controlling me, I can do anything I want to, in a rather more formal way, usually about toward the end of latency. Now, and in fact it is said of these grandiose children that unlike adults who spend money, these children spend goodwill. And very interestingly, what happens to manic children is that everybody begins to dislike them. And if ever you're looking after a youngster who suddenly everybody is disliking, you begin to suspect, and I think our reactions are very important, you begin to suspect that in fact you may have a child with a manic type of illness. And you can, essentially what happens is that these children, when they reach puberty, really they're often actors, they become incredibly grandiose, they look quite psychopathic actually, because why should I take any notice of reality? You know, it's very much like the sort of adult who goes out and spends the non-existent family fortune. I mean, reality isn't significant. Now, you get a child like this in which all the indications clinically look as if this is a manic child, and then you turn up a positive dexamethasone tr test, which is the sort of response you get in a child who is suffering from perhaps a, a unipolar equivalent type of illness. And then you really, as it were, in terms of what sort of biological intervention you might use, are really in trouble. Because, of course, if you give the child a tricyclic and they suddenly become manic, then are they becoming manic as a sort of flight from their depressed state, quote, or are they becoming manic because they really are manic? And, and these are some of the issues you have to deal with. Now, I don't want to spend all the time today talking about biological interventions, except to tell you, and, and I hope I have, that, that in terms of um, the, as it were, biological underpinning of s violent and other types of disturbed behavior in youngsters, the situation is messy and complicated, much messier and more complicated, as a matter of fact, than it is with adults.
But now let's look at the behavioural issues. Must a child be violent? That is to say, if a youngster suffers from affective rage and predatory violence as a response to affective rage, what are we going to do about it? We can give the youngster a pill, but this sure as hell will not stop him or her from planning violence and being violent, because they've learned to do it. Now, the very interesting thing goes on, I think, which I think is fascinating. It would appear that the more disturbed a child is, that is, the more they suffer from incomprehensible mood changes, however they experience them, the more likely are they to be enormously obedient to what a social system implicitly asks them to do. That is, disturbed children are very, very obedient to environmental consistency. You see this, by the way, in the youngsters who attempt suicide or kill themselves at the age of 16 or 17 and who have been described as the all-American boy or girl before they do it. That is the perfectly seemingly healthy child who abruptly commits suicide at 17 and it looks incomprehensible. And when you go and uh, sort of do as it were a psychological autopsy, you find that this youngster comes from a very healthy family they don't all come from disturbed families. Coming from a very healthy family, this youngster has been everything one would expect him or her to be. And then suddenly and abruptly, they kill themselves. Now, we hypothesize that what happens is this, that very healthy families, in fact, give their children enormously consistent messages. A healthy family, how many of us ever belong to this, do not shout at our children at don't shout. Because if you shout don't shout, you are not telling children not to shout. You are saying shout bigger and better and louder. A healthy family does not hit Johnny because he hit Jane. Because he, you're not telling the child not to bully, you're just telling the child if you're going to bully, be, a, be good at it. And so healthy families give extraordinarily consistent messages. That is, they do and say the same thing. Now, very disturbed children who suffer from psychic pain because of external conflict, if they belong to a healthy family, have safety in doing what the family wants. So if the family has a consistent set of values, a really seriously mood-disturbed child can look terribly healthy because they are doing what the family expects them to do. But in our culture, come 16 or 17, you are expected to become autonomous. And that however healthy your family might be, they cannot protect you from this demand. And so these mood-disturbed children who are obeying a consistent system and looking healthy cannot tolerate the stress imposed by, as it were, the outer system, and they may, indeed, if they're potentially depressed, kill themselves. Now, if you come from a family that I choose to call unhealthy, and not in a pejorative way, but as a statement as to what they're like, their messages are blindingly inconsistent. The classic, if I may be ethnic, is uh, the way English cockneys behave. And on a train to South End, which is the equivalent of Atlantic City, I shall never forget watching a cockney family with its children. And the children were very rowdy and very turbulent and very noisy. And mother sort of hits the child and says, I told you not to do that, love, which is the most incredibly inconsistent message one has ever heard, isn't it? Because, you know, here you are saying words of love, inflicting pain the while. And so, of course, what they breed are violent children, because violence is the consistency in the family. So, in effect, unhealthy families offer consistent messages which are often antithetical, I would suggest to you, to the overt message. 
we do not do what we say. And, you know, the sociologists have had fun with this, if I may use the phrase, particularly in terms of the double bind concept. You, you know this one, uh, when mother says, uh, help me with the dishes, dear, and 16-year-old son says, in a minute, and then mother goes off and does it herself and clatters the dishes. It's amazing how this always appeals to everyone, this story. We've all been through it. And then you say, let me help now. And she says, it's all right, dear, I can do it myself. You know, and goes on clattering the dishes. Now that's a very inconsistent message, isn't it? It says, I will do it myself, but the basic message is, but you so-and-so, you didn't help when you should have. Now the more disturbed youngsters are, the more they will obey implicit messages. And so if the implicit message in the family is, when you are frustrated, be violent, then children who are mood disordered are likely to adopt violence as a technique of handling their mood disorder. Now, in addition to that sort of degree of inconsistency, there's another process goes on in families, which I think is fascinating and is one actually that isn't talked about very much in terms of child rearing in our society. It's the interesting process of dehumanization. And I think one of the fascinating things about children is we haven't studied much about when children humanize and when children dehumanize. Humanization, you know, is the process by which we make the incomprehensible comprehensible. That's why we used to give, when, when women were thought of as, you know, quiet and submissive, whenever those days were, uh, uh, hurricanes always had women's names, which I find absolutely fascinating, because after all, you know, Hurricane Edith was controllable, because after all, women were theoretically supposed to be controllable. Now, um, uh, so that's a type of humanization, which is to explain the incomprehensible, and primitive man has done this all the time. But we also humanize animals, and the process by which children learn to humanize their pets and then dehumanize their pets is an extraordinarily interesting one which has not been studied very much. But children are dehumanized by their parents. And dehumanization means that essentially you are treating your child as if it were a thing rather than respecting the child's integrity. And I think, by the way, this explains why violence gets transmitted through families, because if you treat your child with excessive violence, then of course you are treating your child as a thing, not a person, and basically you're dehumanizing the child, and when you dehumanize children, they learn as adolescents, and they've learned very efficiently, to dehumanize others. And so one of the interesting problems then is this, that if you get a mood disordered youngster who is mood disordered and becomes violent and if that youngster comes from a family which is violent you're in trouble because the youngster will use violence as a technique of relieving tension but if in addition that youngster comes from a family that dehumanizes in a pathological way that youngster then has the following. Under stress, I will treat people as if they were things. Under stress, my response in terms of dealing with stress is to hit out. And if in addition you have a youngster with a mood disorder which is going to lead to a rage response, you then have a very dangerous child. Because, you see, here's a youngster with a mood-driven rage reaction who has learned that violence is acceptable, technically violence is egocentric, who has been dehumanized himself or herself and thus dehumanizes. And so, in effect, you then have a youngster who is biologically damaged, who is socially damaged, who is psychologically damaged. And one of the very interesting aspects of treatment is what are you to do about this? Now, mostly we don't do anything. And mostly, actually, these youngsters get propelled into the penal system. And you'd be interested to know that in corrections, 30% of children have diagnosable mood disorders. 
which means that in fact in terms of the sieving that goes on in our society of children who behave in a disturbed way quite apart from cognitive disabilities where interestingly the same 30 percent figure applies 30 percent of children have mood disorders now what can you do now as a matter of fact one is really faced i think with a whole fascinating issue of what psychiatric hospitals should be like and one of the things that I think is a very interesting experience, if I am right in saying that the more vulnerable you are, the more you will conform to consistent messages, and in social systems, the consistent messages are both, are always implicit, and sometimes they're explicit and implicit, but they're always that implicitly. These don't change. If you go ask yourself in an average hospital unit, or an average psychiatric hospital unit, what is this system really telling people to do? It's a terribly interesting question with a rather frightening answer. Every so often in one's professional career, you know, you have something happen which sort of really underlines a point. If I may tell a personal story, when I ran the Adolescent Treatment Center at the University of Michigan, uh, we once had a terribly disconcerting episode in which the girls set themselves up in the day room to sexually service the boys. And there they were, cheerfully offering what I think in the vernacular is known as blowjobs to the young men who were rather cheerfully accepting this service. <laughs> However, while this was going on, and this is absolutely true, the staff were in the nurse's station giggling and being sort of salacious over one of the cruder sexual magazines. So you sort of pay your money and take your choice. Here were a staff who apparently for some interesting reason were very interested in really a rather sort of dehumanized form of sexuality and there were the children behaving that way. Now one swallow does not make a summer but it's very interesting um, to, um, you know, see what was happening. Now, let's look at violence in units. If you have treatment units that put people in restraints, I might say I was well aware of the pun, if you, <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you put people in restraints in uh, a treatment center, it's very interesting to watch what the staff do when they do this. Because in tr treatment centers for adults, adolescents, or children, where physical restraints are used, good staff do two things. On the one hand, they hold the children so they won't hurt themselves, and they always do this. And then if the system says, you are to put the child in restraints because they behaved in an unacceptable way, the staff move the children to the restraining situation. And when they do this, the whole tenor of the interaction very dramatically changes, and from one in which the child is beginning to calm down, it gets violent. Because the first time a youngster is put in restraints, they of course get very frightened because this is absolute helplessness, by the way, which I find fascinating in terms of punitiveness, that the one thing people can't stand we inflict on them, to spread eagle them on a bed, you see, and make them helpless, is really a hairy thing to do. So the children begin to fight at the moment that they are about to be put in restraints. And the staff as human beings have no alternative but to fight back. So what you've got is that in response to violent behavior, we've devised a social response which carries the message that violence is acceptable. And very interestingly, units that use this technique in fact get this technique, get this occurring. So if you wish to treat violent children, you cannot treat them in units that use violent responses. Now if you start to think this way, look at what we do with suicidal precautions. If, for example, somebody makes a suicidal attempt and we decide that we will put them on suicidal precautions that take everything from them, are we not provoking them to attempt suicide? Um, and if you look at these reactions you find that again and again social systems give permission for them. 
Now, because one of the other problems in adolescence, which is very interesting, is not to do is to do. If you don't respond at all, you are giving permission. If you do respond, you have to respond in a way that does not give permission and a way that is consistent. And if I'm right in thinking about it this way, then of course you quite certainly have to look at how we deliver care and what the implication of the therapeutic social systems might be. Finally, in terms of psychological responses, if you cannot make a meaningful emotional relationship with another human being, it is almost certain that nobody can do anything. That every treatment intervention we use, and I don't care whether it's behavior modification, cognitive therapy, analysis, social system therapy, whatever you're using, they are all based on the implicit assumption that the human being is capable of making meaningful emotional relationships. And if a human being is so damaged, that they cannot make meaningful emotional relationships. It is almost certain in our society at the moment that whatever we may understand about the biological causes of their difficulty, whatever we may understand about the social causes of their difficulty, whatever we understand about the psychological etiology of their difficulty, there is almost certainly nothing we can do about it. Now, I guess... Or, what I think is interesting about adolescent programs is that adolescents are developing personality-wise. And if you can resolve the sorts of issues that I'm talking about, you may, as it were, speedily put youngsters back on de onto developmental tracks which are healthy. And remarkably, however difficult they may be, about 80% of them ought to recover. I was told to finish at 10 to 1. At 10 to 1, I finished. Thank you very much.